Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful morning in which to worship you. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon this place. Be present here among us. Open our hearts and our minds to your word. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to hear from you today. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are back to our summer uh, preaching series. We're looking at the book of Hebrews. Uh, and I have titled this series, Hebrews, Serving Up a Better Cup, uh, because the book of Hebrews really uh, is addressed to early Christians, uh, particularly those who were uh, Jewish originally uh, and who had come to faith. Uh, and because they were experiencing uh, difficulties and persecution, uh, they, many of them were tempted to fall back into their old Jewish uh, traditions and ways, uh, and so the church leadership uh, wrote this letter to uh, these uh, early Christians uh, to remind them uh, that the Christian faith uh, really is the, um, is the culmination, is, is the superior uh, faith to their old ways, and so it is reminding them of all the ways that Jesus is better than what they had before. Uh, and so today we're actually looking at the covenant itself, the, the new covenant. Uh, and so we will talk about that as we go along. We're in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Now, the main point in what we're saying is this. We, that is, we Christians, we have such a high priest. We have such a great high priest, one who is actually seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent that the Lord, and not any mortal, has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests already who offer according to the law. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. So, what they're saying is, Jesus is our high priest, and he is so much better than any earthly high priest. However, and this is... This is kind of the interesting thing with our humanity. However, if Jesus were here on earth, he would not be a high priest. And we've talked about this before, that had all that stuff we talked about, Melchizedek, because Jesus, according to the Jewish law, was not descended from the tribe of Levi. Therefore, he could not be a priest. He was not descended from Aaron himself, so he couldn't be a high priest according to the old law. But Jesus is our high priest in heaven, in the sanctuary where God himself dwells. They, that's the, the human uh, earthly priests, they offer worship in a sanctuary that is but a sketch and a shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But Jesus now has obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. So here's the thing. If you go back to the Old Testament and you read... Uh, like in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all that, and it gives you all of these details about how they were to erect the tabernacle, the, the place in their midst where God was to dwell with them. And there were very specific and detailed instructions on what that tabernacle was to look like. The reason for that is because the tabernacle is actually a, an earthly copy of God's actual throne room in heaven. Now, in the earthly copy, they were told to make these tapestries that held that that hung on the walls uh, in the in the holy place and in the holy of holies, and and stitched into these tapestries were 
seraphim were angels stitched into the, the, the tapestry. But in the actual temple, in, in, in God's actual dwelling place, there are actual live cherubim flying around. So the, the tabernacle was a copy. Was, it, it's like if, if you take your, your license and you go in and you put it on the photocopier and you copy it, it's, it's not the original. It's, it's a facsimile. It's, it's similar to, it looks kind of like, but it isn't the original. Jesus, on the other hand, is the high priest in the actual throne room of God, in the actual place where there are seraphim flying around. He is the high priest. And he has enacted a better covenant with better promises. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. Now, this is important. Here we have, <clears throat> this is the Bible, just in case you aren't really sure. This part here is the Old Testament. Old Testament means Old Covenant. Testament, covenant, same word. This is the Old Covenant. This here is the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is the covenant which God made with Moses, which encompassed the law. The Old Covenant makes sense to us as humans because it is a covenant of rewards and consequences. We understand that. We understand you work hard, you do what you, you are supposed to do, you get a paycheck. You don't work hard, you turn up late for work, you don't really do what you're supposed to do, you don't get a paycheck, you get fired. That's reward or punishment. That, that's the Old Testament. If you follow these laws, if you do what I say, you will be blessed. You will live long in the land. You will have many children. You will be prosperous. If you don't follow these laws, if you don't do what I tell you to do, then some other country's going to come in and they're going to conquer you and they're going to take you off into exile. That's reward and punishment. You do what I say, good things happen. You don't do what I say, bad things happen. That is the old covenant. That is that the first two-thirds of our Bible. That is the old covenant. Jesus has brought in a new covenant with better promises because the new covenant is not based on reward and consequences. It is based on this thing which we as humans find it very difficult to wrap our heads around. Is called grace. Grace is very different than reward and punishment. Grace is based on mercy and forgiveness. The reality is we understand the old covenant. We understand reward and punishment, but the problem with that old covenant is every one of us understands reward and punishment when it applies to everyone else. Everyone else ought to follow the rules. Everyone else ought to do what they are supposed to do. I, however, I have special circumstances. I, however, am late for work, and so the speed limit doesn't apply to me. That's how we interpret the Old Covenant. It, it absolutely, we, we believe in rules. We believe that people should follow the rules, especially you. But I, I have, I have these special circumstances. I, I, the, the law only applies to me when it works for me, when it's convenient for me. Otherwise, it's optional. That's how we think. And so the Old Covenant doesn't actually work. And for centuries, 
The Jews followed the Old Covenant. And they followed it because, one, the, the teachers of the law created hundreds of additional laws that really just helped you to get around the original laws. They were loopholes. And so, essentially, this, this Old Covenant, if you did what, what you're supposed to do, you lived long and prospered in the land. If you didn't do what you, ha- you were supposed to do, technically, the penalty was <coughs> death. However, God set up this, well, I know you're going to make an occasional mistake. And when that happens, rather than you dying immediately, you can offer something in your place. You can offer a goat or a sheep or, depending on what the, the, uh, the sin was, a, a dove or some other animal or bird, you, you bring it to the temple and you give it to the high priest. The high priest will offer it and that sin will be covered. Well, that was supposed to be on those occasions when we slipped, when, when, we, when we didn't quite do what we were supposed to do, and we recognized it, and we came to God and said, oh, I slipped, I messed up again. You make a sacrifice, and that sin is covered. The problem is that the way that we took it was, I can pretty much do whatever I want, and I just have to take the correct offering to the temple, and I'm good with God. So instead of making occasional sacrifices, the temple was busy 24-7 all the time making sacrifices for all the people's sins because they just sinned and sinned and sinned and made sacrifices for all of them. Didn't work. And so God himself came. And he offered the one sacrifice that would cover it all. That would cover everything that you have ever done or thought or said. Anything that you're currently doing. And anything that you will do in the future. It is all covered by the blood of Jesus. For that first covenant wasn't faultless. And so we needed a second. And then we have the uh, quote which Gene read for us earlier from uh, the Old Testament, from Jeremiah. And then in verse 13, the writers say, in speaking of a new covenant, Jesus has made the first one obsolete and growing old, it will soon disappear. So Jesus came and he brought us this new covenant, this covenant of grace, this covenant that says, I have already paid for your sins. You're forgiven. You're freed from the guilt. You're freed from the penalty do you for your sin. You are free. All you need to do is come to Jesus to accept what he has already done for you. Forgiveness. Clean slate. You're good with God. But see, grace doesn't really make sense to our human minds. We we don't understand forgiveness. We have a hard time forgiving ourselves, much less anybody else. And we have a tendency to hold on to things. But God says, listen, you're forgiven. And you need to forgive everybody else. 
We struggle with that. We, we prefer the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We prefer knowing that somebody is getting what we consider to be justice. But what God offers us is grace, is forgiveness. And we think, well, that's, that's too easy. How can that be fair? Especially when, when we see God forgive people who we consider way worse than us. And Jesus told that parable about the landowner who went out early in the morning and he hired some workers to work his fields and, and he took them home and then at, at noon he went out again and he hired some more and he brought them back. And then again at three he goes out and he hires some more and he brings them back. And at the end of the day he pays everybody the same. That's not fair. Some of us worked all day. Some just got here. And you pay us all the same? Well, those first workers had agreed to work a day for a day's wage. It was a fair, it was, it was the going rate. They agreed to it. And that's what they got paid. He didn't cheat them. He didn't pay them less. But he says, it's my money. I paid you what we agreed to. If I want to pay everybody else the same, that's my prerogative. It's my money. That's grace. We all get forgiven. But we don't like the unfairness of that. And you know, we, we pray. We'll, we'll pray later this morning. We pray every week. You may pray it at home. We pray the Lord's Prayer. And we pray, forgive us our debts. We, we want to be forgiven. But we actually pray to God, forgive us our debts as... We forgive our debtors. We are, we are asking God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. That'll sober you up. Forgiveness. And here is the amazing thing. If we accept what Jesus has done for us, if we turn our lives over to Him, He sends the Holy Spirit who indwells us and who helps us to actually live the way that He would want us to live. Now, it doesn't happen like that. Sometimes it takes time, it takes years. But if we follow, if we listen, he begins to change the way that we think. He begins to change the way that we treat other people. He begins to change the way that we speak. He begins to change us to make us into the people that he created us to be. That's what it means, even back in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, when God said, in this new covenant, I will write my law on their hearts. I will make it a part of who they are, and they will just begin to live it out. But we have to come to him. 
We have to accept what he has done. We have to let him begin to change us so that we can be agents of change in the world. You know, we look at the world around us. And I think for most of us, we recognize something is not right. The world is not the way that it should be. The world is not the way that we would want it to be. And yet we often point the finger elsewhere. It's their fault. Well, even Michael Jackson recognized that you've got to look at the man in the mirror. That's where the change has to start, in me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your amazing love for us that you recognize that we cannot do it on our own, that we cannot do the things that we ought to do even when we want to. But Lord, you have made a way for us to be forgiven, for us to have a clean slate, and for you to begin to work in us a new life, a life that begins to look more and more like you. Help us. Help us to turn our lives over to you. Help us to allow you to work in us and through us that we might be the beginning of recreating the world in your image. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.